moment. Only in that relationship with our Heavenly Father do we find everything that satisfies us, and so He is our great priority. Welcome to Corinth Baptist Church Sunday Worship Services with Pastor Teacher Joey Carroll. When pastors fall into sin, they gouge out the road of the gospel. If you're born again, and yet you are unrepentant in sin and unwilling to deal with sin in your life, you're gouging out the road to advance the gospel. I want to talk to you about peace, uh, particularly Ephesians 2.14 this morning, for He Himself is our peace. Ephesians chapter 2. As long as you can see verse 14 and 15, I think you'll be okay. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you so much uh, for the blessing of uh, just being able to come into your house and with your people and, and worship you this morning, Father. Uh, Lord, we're just so thankful for the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, and redeeming us to you, Father, and just giving us a hope, giving us a future, uh, giving us access to God the Father where we can come to him at any time and bow before the throne of God and have our Father fill us with all of His goodness and His peace and His joy. Father, I pray that we'd find that this morning as we come to You, as we draw near to You in the preaching of the Word. Father, thank You so much for the children that You have blessed us with in this body. I thank You for their unique giftings and the talents that You've given them. And thank You for their ability this morning to draw us closer to You in worship as well, Father. Father, I pray that, uh, again, Your Spirit would be with us this morning to guide us. Give us understanding of the text. Help us to understand with our minds. Help us to humble ourselves in our hearts and our will. And help us to walk in humble obedience to the truth that we find in Scripture. All this I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're dealing with the passages, really, 11 through 22. And there's three problems, for lack of a better word, in these passages. And we dealt with one of those issues last week with the exclusion of the Gentiles. And verse 12 pretty much sums that up for the Apostle Paul when he says that we were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And we said, and it's, it's true, that was our state before the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. We as Gentiles had absolutely no access to God whatsoever. Well, how did God fix that problem? Look in verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were formerly far off have been brought near, and here it is, by the blood of Christ. So through the death of Christ, we gained access to God. And if you're here this morning, you have a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ, you can walk into the throne room anytime you want. Your priest, the Lord Jesus, is sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf, and you have access to God. That's enough to set your heart ablaze for all eternity. That's why in verse 14 he says, He himself is our peace. And so here's the flow of the thought. There's a problem. The problem is addressed and reconciled through the cross, and peace is immediately established and that's the case in all three of these issues that we find in these passages. Now Paul will come back to us in verse 19. Look at verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household. So he'll come back to the issue of the Gentiles, but he pauses in the midst of this and he wants to fix two problems before he comes back to us. And both of those he describes, if you have the NASB, I'm not sure what the ESV says or the King James, but he describes him as enmities or strife. Look with me in verse 14. For Christ himself is our peace, who made both groups, Jew and Gentile, into one, broke down the barrier of the dividing, dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity or the hostility, which the NASB describes as the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So there's one enmity or hostility, it existed between Jew and Gentile, and we'll talk about that this morning. For your study time and for the sake of preparing for next week being Easter, look at the other enmity in verse 16. And, he's going to add to the thought, he might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it the cross having put to death the enmity or the hostility. They're not the same. 
One is the division between Jew and Gentile. The other is the division between us and God. And you know that through the cross, all the enmity in humanity, all the problems, all the hostilities are broken down through the cross. And the cross always brings peace. And it's amazing how many times peace is mentioned in these passages. Look back with me at verse 14. For he himself is our peace. Look at verse 15 when he finishes breaking down the enmity between uh, Jew and Gentile. Look at the last part of verse 15. Thus establishing peace. Once he brings reconciliation between us and God in verse 16. Look at what verse 17 has. And Christ came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. So we have three problems. Three times he brings up the cross and three times he immediately goes to the issue of peace. And if we start talking about peace, everybody gets involved at that point. Even the world's ears perk up when we start talking about peace because the world wants peace. The world pursues peace. It's really the longing of every man's heart because with peace comes so many other good things. It's security, prosperity, confidence. To live in peace is a tremendous blessing. So when I tell you, and it's true, that the cross of Christ has accomplished peace, the world hears the word peace, and they want that too. And I'll give you a little hint toward the end, but they're never going to find it. Because peace is only found in a person, and it can't be found anywhere else. Yet the world is all out in pursuit of peace. If you grew up during my time, we pursued peace through war. It wasn't quite in the 60s, but if you think about the 60s and, and early 70s, and the 70s then with the Vietnam War, we pursued peace through war. And that was why the struggle was so thick during the 60s, and there was so much division between politics and people, because the people wanted love to win, and, and the government was pursuing war, and everybody wanted peace, but... They made fun of the government because how can you have peace with war by killing people? Yet that's how we pursued peace. And it is a little bit to think about in those respects, but we'll have peace or I'll kill you was basically how we went after that. Now with especially Obama, it was peace through policy. He, he never wanted to fight in any kind of war. He wanted to pursue peace through policies like the United Nations. And so we put all the emphasis on that. Let's just get together and try to agree on as much as we can agree in pursuit of peace. Well, we know that the war thing didn't work out and neither is the policy thing not working out either in establishing peace at all. We have peace through philosophy. Kids and I, in page two, we love to watch movies, especially on Friday nights when Audrey comes home. If you want to know where we're at, we're all in the den, piled up on the couch, uh, with Odd, with snack bags, watching the movie of the week. One of our favorites is all the Mission Impossibles. And the last one had the philosophy in it that is, you find it today, and it's one of my favorite quotes in all the movies. It's bizarre. You'll think, why is this one of his favorite? But listen to the philosophy that drove that whole movie, and they quoted it several times. There cannot be peace without first a great suffering, and the greater the suffering, the greater the peace. There's a lot of truth in that, by the way. And someday the world will figure out great suffering has brought great peace because our great suffering was sin, and sin brought Christ, and Christ brought peace. So there is truth to that philosophy, but they don't know how to get there. There is the philosophy that we would have peace if we could end all religions. And that's still going on today. Religions really do divide us, and people are in pursuit of trying to end all religions so we can just live in the moment. Then there's the idea that we could have peace if we could not end all religions, but blend all religions. And if you've ever seen the coexist bumper sticker, that's what that's all about. It takes the major world religions and tries to just get us to sit down together and just have some sort of ecumenical prayer group. I don't know, something bizarre but it's trying to get us to blend our religions and have this idea, hey, we all worship God or God, so what's the big deal? Last couple of thoughts. Politicians promise peace. Musicians sing about peace. And even though all of us agree that we need peace, have you ever seen people so divided as they are today? 
everybody is so radicalized and divided in their opinions. We have racial division today uh, almost like no other time. We have religious division today. We have political party divides, social divides, economic divides, educational divides. And I know from the world's perspective, they look at this and they have to drop their head and go, we're never going to get there. And they're right. You're never going to get there. It's getting worse, whether or not they've noticed that. Someone made a funny comment this past week on Twitter. And they said, if you were stranded on a desert island all by yourself, found a stick, wrote a statement in the sand, someone would easily find you from Twitter because they would show up and want to argue about what you put in the sand. That's true. All you got to do today is make a statement, whether it's on your T-shirt, on the bumper of your car, or on social media, and somebody's going to show up and they're going to argue with you no matter what you say. That's just how we are today. Now, the biggest reason why we will never have peace in this world is because we do not agree on what has caused all the brokenness. Now, we as the children of God know exactly what has caused all the brokenness, and we've already talked about that in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. Look back at those passages. You were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath even as the rest. There you go. If you can't properly diagnose the disease, you can't treat it. Dad had a mini stroke last week, and we were in the hospital for, I don't know, 36, 48 hours. Dad was frustrated because they didn't do anything, but I wasn't because they didn't know what it was. They ran test after test after test after test after test, and they could not find anything wrong, so they did nothing. And I'm good with that. Because you can't do what's needed unless you understand what's wrong. And because the world doesn't understand that the reason that we have so much division is because of sin, they don't have the answer. But because we have properly diagnosed the condition of the world and the condition of the man's heart, we know what's needed. And what's needed is the gospel. And that's why in verse 4 through 10 is the gospel. But God, being rich in mercy, right? He extended His grace to us through the cross of Christ. And so we know what's wrong, and we know what the solution is. And I guess if I really loved you, we could stop right there and pray. Because that's, that's it. That's the answer to peace. That's what's wrong, and that's how we fix it. But let's go on. I don't love you that much. In Scripture, real peace is always, always, always associated with Christ. We read this around Christmas time. Usually one of the kids say it, and it's funny because they have the lisp going on. They're missing a few teeth. I'm not gonna, I've got that in my mind, so I'm going to try not to read it that way, Anna. Isaiah 9, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. We read that every year. When Christ was born, you'll recall what the angels said in Luke 2, 14, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men. And then they add this phrase, with whom he is pleased which causes us to pause and think about, well, who's going to experience peace? Well, it's a particular peace. Because Jesus himself says in Luke 12, Do you suppose that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. So we're confused. When the angels sang at his birth, they said peace on earth. And when Jesus spoke, he said, I didn't come to bring peace on earth. So you're left with the thought, well, who gets the peace? And he clears that up in John 14, speaking with his disciples right before he leaves. He says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And so we understand as the people of God, you and I have peace. But if you belong in the world, you don't know peace. 
And that causes a lot of division between us who have the peace and the world who does not have the peace. When we get to Ephesians 6, you don't have to turn there. We're going to find a verse in verse 15 that this is referred to as the gospel of peace. And you know why it's called the gospel of peace? It's because that through the cross, peace is established. But think about that. Through the cross... How did God bring us peace? Through death. You see, getting peace through war is not so bizarre because what's really bizarre is getting peace through death. Christ sheds His blood and dies, and in exchange, we get peace. So there's no peace through war. There's no peace through policies. There's no peace through philosophies. There's only peace through blood, and that's the blood of the Son of God. And that's why we come to Ephesians 2.14 and it makes this very profound statement, for He Himself is our peace. If you're taking notes, this is what it literally says, for He Himself and no one else. I love that. For He Himself and no one else is our peace. What does that mean? Well, first let's understand the problem. Look with me at verse 14. Ephesians 2.14, For Christ Himself and no one else is our peace, who made both groups into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall. Well, let's talk about that for just a second. The barrier of the dividing wall that existed between Jew and Gentile. There was a barrier that stood between. Now, there's physical representation to this barrier and there's a spiritual representation. The physical representation was at the temple. Interestingly enough, though, not the first... You remember the temple that David wanted to build, that God gave him the instructions, and David handed that off to Solomon, and Solomon built that temple? There were some divisions, but there were only three. Listen to the divisions. There was a place for all the people. There was a special room for the priest who God had set aside to be his own, to minister to him. And then there was the Holy of Holies. People, priests, Holy of Holies. By the time we get to the second temple and by the time that Herod messes with it in the times of Jesus, listen to all the places of division that existed in the temple. Unapproved, I would add by Scripture. There was the court of the Gentiles. There was the court of the women. There was the court of the Israelite men. There was the court of the priests. And then there was the Holy of Holies where God was. Oh, we've gone from three to five. We're backing up. In the Gentiles, there was a wall that was all the way around the temple, all four sides. It was four foot high. And there were signs placed along that wall telling the Gentiles, by appointment of death, if you cross the barrier. In other other words, if you Gentiles come into the court of the women, which is next for the Hebrew women, the Israelite women, if you Gentiles cross that barrier, we'll put you to death and it's your own fault because we've warned you. There was a physical barrier that excluded us from getting into the temple. And we won't turn there for the sake of time. I wanted to turn there. But if you remember in Acts 21, if you're taking notes, Acts 21 and 27, I mean Acts 21, 27 through 29, Paul gets accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple area, crossing the wall. This is why he's in jail. This is why he's writing the letter of Ephesians. And this is why I I think probably this physical barrier is on his mind because he knows that through the gospel that wall's broken down. And I can't imagine Paul going to the temple, having understood the gospel, not not wanting to smash every wall that he could find at the temple and going into the Holy of Holies and just sliding the curtain back and going, here's God. If you want Him, come through Christ. But he had to go to the temple and see all the divisions. He had to see where the Gentiles were kept out. He had to see where the women were kept out. He had to see where the men were kept out. He had to see where the priests were kept out. And then finally the Holy of Holies. And Paul's probably shaking his head going, this is insane. The barriers have been broken down. That was the physical representation. But there was a spiritual representation. Look back at verse 15. By abolishing in his flesh, there's the reference to the cross, the enmity or the hostility between Jew and Gentile, which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So the law caused the enmity. 
but God did not intend it to cause the enmity. Let me talk about two words really quick. The word distinct and the word divide. You need to understand the difference. Distinction, it was the purpose of the law. To set people apart and reflect the glory of God. But rather than using the law to make things distinct, they used the law to make things divide, and the Jews divided themselves. And we talked about this last week with racial superiority. They weren't distinct. They used it to divide. When we think about the moral law, this is how it should have made things distinct. The moral law, which included the Ten Commandments, we'll just think about the first two. You shall have no other gods but me. And for a Gentile, they were polytheists. They had all kinds of gods. Well, the Jew just had one. It's interesting that a Gentile called a Jew an atheist because the Jews didn't believe in the gods. And the Jews called the Gentiles atheists because they didn't believe in the one true God. So everybody called everybody else an atheist. Not only that, the second commandment, you shall not make for yourself any idol nor bow down to it and worship it. That was designed to make things distinct. The Jews didn't have idols. The Gentiles had idols all over their home. Not division, but distinct. Look at us and see how we're different. We worship the one true God and we don't have idols. The ceremonial law caused a whole lot more distinction. When we think about the ceremonial side of the law, and don't let me lose you in this, but this was the customs of the nations. This included the feast and the festivals, the Sabbath, the circumcision, the Passover. This included the sacrifices and the priests that gave access to God. This included the dietary laws, that which was clean and unclean. This included the laws for how they dressed. You couldn't mix cotton and wool. This included the, the laws for the farming. You couldn't mix different seeds in a field. All that was supposed to point to the otherness and the separateness of God. It was supposed to allow the Gentiles to look over here at these Jews and go, Man, they're different. They're unique. They're distinct. They keep things separate. They don't eat what's unclean. They eat this stuff that was clean. It was never meant for the Jews to look down on the Gentiles and think of them as dogs. You guys just eat anything. So, in other words, you, you couldn't meet your Gentile friend at the barbecue place and sit down and have a barbecue sandwich. But you could communicate to your Gentile friend why it was that you chose not to eat barbecue because you were glorifying God by walking in obedience to His commands. So rather than allowing it to be distinct, the Jews crossed their arms, stuck their hands in their pocket, and looked at the Gentiles and just thought, man, you talk about a worthless, trashy group of people. That's all y'all are. Now, when Jesus came onto the scene, He modeled the distinctiveness of God, the holiness of God, the otherness of God. You think about this. The sacrifices, all the animal sacrifices that could never atone. And Jesus came and became the one true sacrifice. In the ceremonial law, all the priests who would die, Jesus became that eternal priest who never dies, who continues to intercede for us. That ceremonial sacrifices and priests that gave us access to God. Jesus came and when he died the, the curtain was rent in two and now the way to God was open. And you remember the words of Jesus when he fulfilled the law fully. His message was not one of division, but his message was one of peace. Verse 17, he came and preached peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. Jesus had to fulfill the law because it pointed to the uniqueness, the otherness, the separateness, the distinctiveness of God. And so when we saw Christ, what does Hebrews 1.3 says? He was the exact representation of the Father. Not only did He fulfill that distinctive purpose of the law, but all the violations that the Jews had committed against the law of God, then He takes all their violation, He sticks it upon Himself, and He dies on the cross to pay the debt. Jesus loved the law. He fulfilled it, and then He satisfied it when He died. And rather than looking at people preaching a message of division, he preaches a message of peace. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. 
Isaiah 55, Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, buy and eat. Incline your ear, come to me, listen that you may live. What a difference. The Jews misunderstood and misapplied the law and said, Stay out or we'll put you to death. Jesus fulfilled the law and said, come to me that you may live. What a difference. My goodness. You talk about getting something wrong. They really got something wrong. Here's my question for you this morning, and we really are getting close to the end. Are we called to continue to live distinct lives from the world? If you have your Bibles, go back to the left to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I want to look at verse 14, and then we'll go back to Ephesians and finish up with, well, yeah, I could go a lot longer, but I won't. Hmm. 2 Corinthians 6, let's look at verse 14. You probably thought this had to do with marriage your whole life, but let me tell you something. It has to do with so much more. 2 Corinthians 6, 14, look at this. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light and darkness? What harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, just as God says, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. I will be a father to you, and I will, I shall be your, or you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Are we called to live distinct lives? Yes. Are we to allow our distinctiveness to divide us? Never. Because we still preach, come. Come. You're welcome. Come. Come to Christ that you may live. I'm different because I met Jesus. And the only reason I'm different is because of the grace of God. Come, His grace extends to all. You come too. There's no walls here. There's no rooms here. Men and women, they're the same. Black and white, they're the same. It does not matter. It's all the same at the cross in Christ. Come. I know I live differently. But that difference is supposed to point to the glory of God, not how I'm unique, but how He's unique. Come and live. No hindrances. Now, that's easy to preach, but let me tell you something. That's different at the ball field. It, it's different because not only do you have to act unique and separate at the ball field, but you also have to be careful how you act around people who don't act unique and separate at the ball field. How do you act at the ball field? And I just bring this analogy up because I was wrestling with this message in an odd incident at the ball field with all this yelling and cussing and screaming going on. How do you act in that moment? Do you feel better? Do you feel more important? Do you feel significant? If you do, you don't understand the gospel. Are you offended? Get over it. You were an offense. You see, at the ball field, you get to experience all this put to practice. You have the opportunity to be distinct, and you have the opportunity to experience people who want to be like the world. And you have to have no walls and no barriers and invite people to Christ and explain why you're distinct. Go back to Ephesians 2, and then we'll finish up. I want to give you one more thought. By the way, that example applies at work, at life, anywhere else you go. I'll get into more of this next week, but I want to introduce this thought, and then I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Look at what he did in verse 15. Christ, through the cross, abolishes a strong word. Made to no effect is a better word. Through the cross... Christ made the enmity of the law to no effect, which was contained in ordinances. Verse 15, here's the purpose. So that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace. Next week I'll talk about one new man. But this week I want you to look at in himself. In himself. 
Christ made one new man. Which brings us back to all the passages that speak about this union, this vital union that we have in Christ. Look back up in verse 13. In verse 13, we were separated from Christ. But now we've been brought near. Why? Look, verse 13. But now in Christ. Verse 15, the enmity that we had between Jew and Gentile. He's fixed that by dying on the cross. Now in Himself. In union with Himself. Look back at verse 14. Christ Himself is our peace. This is why... The world can't have peace. We're back to it and we're, we're done. Because in order to have peace, you have to be in Christ. Remember Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Where is that? In Christ. You can't have peace if you're apart from Christ. If you're in Christ... You have peace already. It's yours. It was purchased at Calvary. It's a sad reality that the world will never know what it longs for. Because before you and I were in Christ, it, it says in Ephesians 2.12, the very last three words of that verse, we were in the world. But now through the cross, you and I are in Christ and we have peace. And we're supposed to stand in the midst of this dying world and be distinct. Not be divisive. Not be holier than thou. But just stand up and be distinct and glorify God and invite people to God through Christ by preaching the message of peace. This morning, if you don't know Christ, don't act like you're okay. You don't have peace. You're jumping all over the place trying to find something to make you content and, and sit down and rest and have a little bit of peace in your heart. But you're not going to find it. It's a gift of God. It's found in a person. It's not a thing. It's a person. And you have to have a relationship with that person. You have to be in Christ. But the good news is, with repentance and putting your trust in Him, you have everlasting peace. Now, if you have that peace, you have a responsibility. Preach the gospel. The condition of the world should break our hearts. Sometimes I get callous, and I just want to think, well, to hell with the world. That's where you're going. Go on. But that's not the attitude we need to have. We need to weep. They don't have what they want. They're scrounging around, desperately trying to find it. They're doing everything they can do in their power to accomplish what they want. And what they want is so simple with repentance and faith. Preach the gospel so the world can come out of the world and come to God through Christ. Let's pray.